Welcome to this class on the topic of organizational culture. I'm going to start this talk with various definitions and you may stop the, the video later at your leisure and make a note of the definitions and read over them carefully and see what they have to say. The first definition is by Martin in 2005 and I'm not going to read through it. It's it's long and it's quite complex in many respects but when you read over it yourself and make some notes on it uh, you'll figure out what, what's been said. So I'm not going to to labour this point. Um, there's a second definition which you can also have a look at later. Um, again attempting to get the essential features of an organizational culture into words and to make it accessible to us. And the final definition I want you to consider is this one here. Actually this one is um, <clears throat> is interesting because it, it just writes the words down that we normally associate when, with culture. When we think about culture these are the words that come to mind. So culture reflects the ideologies, shared philosophies, values, beliefs, assumptions, attitudes, expectations and norms of an organization. There are so many so many parts to that that it makes it very, very wide. However, those are three definitions. As I said, you can stop the video and have a look at those, make a note of a, make notes on them later at your leisure. Now to, to move on. Well, an organizational culture refers to the underlying values, beliefs and codes of practice that is involved in shaping up an environment, society and the self-image of its members. So an organizational culture is about values, beliefs, codes of practice. Um, it's within the organization the organization will reflect the environment and the society and the self-image of the people working for the organization will reflect broadly what is expected in that society. So they will have an image of themselves as members of the organization, members of the business, but also as members of the society. So there is obviously an overlap between the two. These are all the characteristics that make a society different from other societies or make a business different from other businesses. So the words here can be applied to businesses and societies and we can differentiate them according to the way we interpret these words and what the words mean in the context of each. So an organizational culture has a range of elements such as symbolism and leadership in order to enhance employee commitment. Um, people relate to the organization, relate to the product. People may be proud of the product they make. For example, if it's a status car, they may be very proud of the fact that they work for the company that make the status car. And there's a sort of leadership issue that they are the best, they are leading the market and the leaders of the company are seen nationally or within the society as also good leaders, as people to be looked up to and respected. Sheen developed a model which outlines the foundations of culture and this is quite useful when we're looking at uh, trying to understand corporate and natural and national cultures. The main attributes of this model state that culture can be explained and understood by analyzing the core values and assumptions of any culture. So what is the the core value? What is the essential values and assumptions of any culture? And if we can understand those, we will understand the culture. Let's have a look at it in slightly more detail. We start with the underlying assumptions. 
which in this case we call level 3. And from these we'll get the, the common values, the beliefs, the attitudes and the norms. Oh, the underlying assumptions of the society, and we'll, we'll talk about these later, and we'll talk about each, each one of these boxes actually later, but <clears throat> the underlying assumptions generates the core values. It gives us the, the system of beliefs, the attitudes, the norms of the society. And from these we get what we can call the perceived culture, what we can see. This is the this is the society that we can see and observe that reflects these beliefs, attitudes and norms which are based on the underlying assumptions. Let's start at the top. Let's look at the perceived culture. This refers to, as I said, the, the, the visible aspect of the culture and it's the most obvious level. It's what we when we look at a, an organization, a business, or a society, or a, a national entity, it's, this is what we see. We see the nature of that business, the way it's reflected in all sorts of artifacts, the buildings, the way it conducts the business, all sorts of issues. But this is the perceived part. This is what we see from the outside. Uh, this is mostly recognised by, peop by people who are not part of the culture um, and as they belong to a different culture it's evident to them that the culture is different. This happens to all of us. If we go on holidays to some exotic country uh, we, we're immediately struck by the difference in culture, by the way the people dress, act, behave. So it's different and this is the perceived level. Outsiders may find it difficult to understand another culture. Um, we, we don't always understand why people do things to do. That's because perhaps we're on the outside looking in. <coughs> or it could be somebody's on the outside looking in at us. Um, but the best way to imagine perceived culture is from that perspective, the perspective of somebody looking in, somebody who's not a part of the culture and who's looking in and seeing the differences. All sorts of factors describe it. Um, dress code, the way people dress in different societies, which may be a function of religious belief or it could be a function of climatic conditions, the, the weather. Um, there could be different furniture, the way people perhaps sit around it at home. The working environment, the way people work. Uh, in continental Europe people may close their shops in the afternoon and have a rest, whereas in Western Europe or Northern Europe they may not do so. They, there's a routine in the way of life that perhaps is different. We have different stories and mythologies and different ceremonies, organizational structures. So we can look at societies, we can look at even businesses, the way the businesses are, are constructed, the way uh, the business practice is implemented to be a reflection of a culture. The most obvious example in terms of business would be Japanese work practices or German work practices compared to many societies where perhaps the work practice is not as as perhaps as efficient in some respects or or not organized in, in a similar fashion not just related to efficiency but to the overall structure of how the business is run so we we see these that's the point now the common values which was the the next box this level looks at uh, factors that determine the perceived culture. This is what the perceived culture is based on. And these common values are developed by leaders on the basis of shared assumptions. So, for example, how the company should undertake its daily routine, how employees should be managed and motivated. 
So the managers have to share the assumptions about what is the best way to motivate the employees. But once they've got the shared assumptions, then they've got common values. And once they've got the common values, they can implement policies to bring about the fulfillment of those values, which is something we can observe, the perceived culture. So it's all building on uh, <clears throat> the assumptions, which generate the common values, which leads to the perceived culture. It's vital that common values developed by leaders are supported by general assumptions of the culture. Um, there are no common values if the underlying assumptions vary from person to person. It would be almost impossible to get common values and therefore it would be almost impossible to present a adherent cultural form as a perceived end. So in order to have a culture we've got to have some sort of agreement about the general assumptions. It could be about the way we live, about the way we work, the way we act, the procedures we have. It could be about almost any of these things or all of them. Now the underlying assumptions, well, these relate to shared values within a culture. Individuals have their own underlying assumptions of the world and how it operates. These can be anything. They could be educational uh, ideas, ideas based on particular theories, or it could be religious, or it could be um, it could be based on storytelling, or it could be based on mythology. It can be based on anything. The assumptions are not visible to the individual. We can't see these. And they're not really directly related to the individual's behaviour or attitude. They're deeper than that. They're inside the person. It's, these are core assumptions. These are assumptions that this person has an emotional commitment to. The person believes in these things. And once you have the belief, and if there's enough people having the same belief, you've got the start of a culture or a subculture. These assumptions can be assumptions articulating human nature or human relations. But they could be about, as I said, it could, it could be about political beliefs, religious beliefs, or educational uh, beliefs, or something that is uh, passed on within the educational system based on mythology or history or something. Something which is inside the people, they, they have a, a basic belief in this, and if enough of them have it, they go on to have the these core values, the common values, and the common values generate the perceived culture. Now, the effectiveness of this model, well, <clears throat> the model in ages enables managers and leaders to evaluate a culture. They'll be able to understand and analyze the relationships between assumptions and business practices within the organization. Once management leaders have an understanding of this model, they can experiment by changing the assumptions in order to help improve efficiency. Now, we're moving away here from the wider society and moving towards the organisation. Um, if, the, if the workers, and the, the managers at all levels for that matter, have assumptions about how the business should run, then in order to bring about a change to business, these underlying assumptions must be challenged and changed. So so that more and more people have commitment to a different set of assumptions which are more in line with the proposed change. Sounds complicated, but this is the the view of how change comes about. 
The need to improve efficiency could be the result of competition, regulation, policies, making it necessary to make changes to assumptions for survival and growth. So whatever the need for efficiency, whatever the need for change, the important thing is to get down to the assumptions and deal with the assumptions and get enough people committed with the changed assumptions set to have common values which lead to the change that we can perceive. Now, let's move to the dimensions of culture. Well, here we can just talk about, again, ideas flowing from what we just had in terms of the model we just looked at. Um, there are six sets of dimensions according to Sheehan. Um, and these determine culture within an organization. Firstly, regular patterns of behavior observed within an organization. This could be done through induction ceremonies uh, in group languages and ritualized behavior. So, if we can take the regular patterns of behavior and uh, have strong induction ceremonies and strong uh, training sessions to reinforce these patterns which are desirable patterns perhaps in terms of the organization and, and where the organization wants to be then we can we can go on to observe these patterns and that leads to a sort of stability within the organization. The embedded values and beliefs expressed by groups and organizations uh, this may be through quality image um, well the embedded values and beliefs are within individuals groups can't have embedded values it's, groups are numbers of individuals but if all the individuals within the group have these embedded values and beliefs then we could say the group has that. We're moving towards a more collective notion here. Well, if the embedded values and, and beliefs again accord with the direction in which the organization wants to move and uh, they facilitate that movement then there is no problem. But if the embedded values and beliefs militate against the proposed changes then there would be an issue and there would be an issue for even the survival of the business. The expected norms of an organization this includes the expected behavior of individuals for example excellent customer service practice well if if the organization sets itself standards standards of behavior and also standards of service and standards of quality then it needs to have a commitment on the part of the workers and the managers to also adopt those those standards and these become the expected norms this this is what is required um, it's getting the commitment to the norms that may be an issue and that's not based just on remuneration that's based on understanding and loyalty to the organization which is also a function of the behavior of management to the workers and vice versa and on many other issues so getting the commitment to the expected norms may be also a problem to be dealt with by management The rules are instructions given by manage management of what must be taken into consideration. These rules have to be followed by employees in order to avoid punishment. Um, there are different ways of looking at this, uh, sort of a stick and carrot approach. Uh, if somebody breaks the rules, they could be punished, they could be sacked, they could be dismissed. Uh, or 
they could be uh, asked to forgo wages or salaries for some period of time. That's the stick. There could be a carrot as well. That in order to get people to follow the rules, there may be bonuses or uh, perks built in to the system, which means people become committed to achieving the targets. And this may actually um, inculcate good behaviour so that eventually the perks and the incentives can be withdrawn and people will still try to achieve the best. After all, there is a commonality here between the workers and the management in terms of the survival of the business. Survival of the business means jobs. Philosophy can be defined as the underlying beliefs that individuals have about people. Philosophy tends to relate to the values of managers who run the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the philosophy, or, or if you like, the, the values of the managers, must be such that it accords with the direction that's to be set for, for the business. It must accord. If, if they don't accord, then there is conflict internal conflict within the business. If the managers do not believe in the direction the business is following, there is not going to be a business, at least not a business with those managers. So there may be very high staff turnover, but there may be issues. If people don't follow or go along with the philosophy, then there are issues about the resolution of conflict as a result of that. The climate of the organisation, this is made up of factors such as the layout of the buildings and the management styles and recreation facilities. Um, in terms of motivation there are models talking about the so-called hygiene factors and the hygiene factors are uh, related to the working conditions, the environment in which people spend a large part of their lives. And if, if the organization is seen as caring and it fits with the community and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nurturing organization, then there may be more commitment on the part of, of business to, uh, to deal with this. So the business, there's more commitment on the part of business to deal with conflicts and to resolve the conflicts amicably. That's the point. Okay, that's, uh, that resolves the, the issue um, or the issues associated with organizational culture that we want to discuss. There are two parts to this class. One is the model that we looked at at the start, going from the underlying assumptions to the common values to the perceived culture, and then there are the the more <coughs> nitty gritty areas, the six recognised dimensions that we've talked about as applied to to businesses. Um, I've just realised before we finish that there is a um, slight error on this video. Um, put the cursor onto the screen here. You'll note here that the slide numbers are slightly out. So go with the, the first number here if you are putting a marker down. So the first slide, there are 37 slides here. Um, the 20 should have been updated to 37. My apologies. Um, in the meantime, that's it for the moment. So thank you for watching.